Good evening. I'm delighted to welcome you all back to the fourth and final Terry Lecture for 2006. Those of you who have followed the lectures so far have, I'm sure, been impressed by the breadth of every edition displayed by Professor Barbara Herrenstein-Smith. Her command of the literature of what she labels the new naturalism is stunning, as well as the uh, comments of its critics. But even more impressive is the analytical care with which she explores arguments both scientific and theological. That sophistication, presented in lucid prose, is matched by the sympathetic hearing she is able to provide even for positions with which she is not in full agreement. We've now heard about attempts to explain religion as a natural phenomenon on the basis of evolutionary psychology and cognitive theory. We've also heard about attempts to find a space for a theological analysis of the natural order compatible with contemporary science. In each case, we have heard why such efforts are not entirely persuasive. The efforts of the new naturalism and the new natural theology are, as Professor Herrenstein Smith suggests, reflections of one another. And hence, her lecture today will explore that reflexivity. The title, Reflections, Science and Religion, Natural and Unnatural. Please welcome back to the podium, Professor Barbara Herrenstein Smith. Thank you, Harry. Um, I'd also like to thank, since it's my last public appearance here, uh, the members of the Terry Committee, especially Harry Attridge, Bill Summers, Dale Martin, Jean Black, and Leo Hickey, along with Waichi Dimmick and Frank Turner for their extraordinary hospitality during my stay here, and Barbara Mordecai for attentions behind the scene and Laura Lee Field for attentions consistently above and beyond, and the Yale University community for supplying such a wonderful audience for these lectures. One of my central points in these lectures, explicit in the first two, is that there are better and worse ways of pursuing the naturalistic study of religion. There are also, I think, better and worse ways of promoting the specifically cognitive evolutionary accounts of religion currently being developed, what I've been calling here the new naturalism, and unfolding their implications, intellectual, institutional, and to a certain extent, ideological. These different ways of reflecting on the new naturalism, and more generally, on the relation of science to religion, will be my focus in this final lecture. I'll begin by commenting on a key term that has remained unexamined here, namely naturalism itself. The current theological wisdom, sorry, the current theoretical wisdom shared by many philosophers of science and theologians is that naturalism comes in two forms, methodological and metaphysical. Methodological naturalism, often equated with the practices of science, is the principled exclusion of appeals to supernatural beings or forces from a certain class of investigations and theories that we call, partly on that account, scientific. Metaphysical naturalism, often equated or associated with materialism or atheism, is the view that there is no realm of being beyond and no entities or forces other than the material, the physical, or as might be said, that which is in nature. But what do we mean by any of these terms and how can we specify neutrally without metaphysical assumptions and thus just going in circles that which is to be understood as ontologically complete? That's a lingering and difficult question in these debates, which I won't attempt to answer here. Obviously, there can be no simple or single answer, uh, but I will be poking at it uh, from a variety of angles. The distinction between the two forms of naturalism figures crucially in a range of current controversies over the relation between science and religion. For example, theological critic Paul Griffiths whom we encountered in the first lecture, 
predicting that the scientific study of religion has no future, charges scholars who promote naturalistic approaches in religious studies with self-refutation, based on the argument that since those scholars evidently think that naturalism is true, but have no empirical grounds for thinking so, they are making metaphysical claims, just like the theologians whose claims about religion they reject for just that reason. But one may reply, naturalism pursued as a method is not the kind of thing that can be true or false. Rather like using low octane fuel or following a low fat diet, it can only be more or less appropriate for the purposes at hand and carried out more or less effectively. Accordingly, the pursuit or promotion of methodological naturalism in religious studies or elsewhere is not open to the charge of self-refutation or as in Griffith's argument and elsewhere to the taunt of tu quoque, you too, so there. The distinction also figures in replies to proponents of intelligent design who charge that the decision by evolutionary biologists to leave divine purpose out of their explanations is arbitrary or based just on personal atheism. Here one may reply that the exclusion has been practiced as a matter of method by theistic as well as atheistic scientists and that it reflects not only long-standing considerations of theoretical and cognitive economy, but also significantly here, the ongoing observation of the practical reliability of explanations so constructed. Where divine purpose is included in an explanation of natural phenomena, the result, as I suggested in the last lecture, may be more congenial to people with religiously instructed cognitive tastes, but the broader communal advantages of maintaining those exclusions, notably the practical reliability of the explanatory theories thereby constructed, are forfeited. That's why Pache, its proponents, intelligent design cannot be claimed as a viable scientific alternative to the Darwinian theory of natural selection. But two points must be added to the current philosophical wisdom about naturalism. One is that the distinction between its metaphysical and methodological forms is not always clear. For example, there's some question as to whether at the apparent limits of scientific knowledge, say in cosmology or quantum theory, the exclusion of the possibility of types of entities or forces other than those currently comprehended by the natural sciences doesn't amount to both a metaphysical claim and a possibly significant intellectual confinement. Or to put it another way, whether under those conditions methodological naturalism doesn't become, in effect, metaphysical naturalism. To be sure, the possibility of such slippage or indistinctness doesn't give an epistemic boost to any specific religious or theistic claim. Notions such as the existence of a personal deity don't become any more valid just because some scientific ideas or programs involve metaphysical assumptions. But it does put both the theistic affirmations and the naturalistic rejections of so-called spooky forces equally outside empirical falsification. Under those limit conditions, they are in effect matters of ontological taste. The second point, which I suggested a moment ago, is that in many current invocations of naturalism, it's assumed that nature itself, along with what's in it, is something self-evidently given and unproblematic. But of course, that's hardly the case. Without rehearsing here the long history of the term in Western thought, we may recall first the very length of that history. Our current term, nature, translates a number of significantly different terms, natura, physis, and so forth, from antiquity. And second, the multiplicity of meanings that would be yielded by any analysis of even its current usages. Thus, while in many scientific and philosophical contexts and related formal discourses, 
nature is equivalent to reality, the cosmos, or simply everything that exists, what I referred to before as the ontologically complete. We also often distinguish it from various other realms or forms of existence, for example, from the man-made, the human, or the social, as in the familiar oppositions of nature to art or culture, or from the mental, as in the contrast between what is actually in nature as opposed to what is merely in our dreams or wishes. And of course, we distinguish the natural from what we call the supernatural and vice versa. Indeed, in contemporary Western discourse, the two terms are mutually dependent and reciprocally signifying. That is, we can speak of the supernatural only because we have nature. And many languages and cultures didn't, and some still don't, have that contradistinction. Or finally, invoking nature normatively but ambivalently, as in medical, moral, or aesthetic discourses, we speak of the natural positively in contrast to the adulterated, the abnormal, or the perverse, but also sometimes negatively in contrast to the refined, the civilized, the developed, or the extraordinary. Clearly, whatever else it is, nature is a notion, an idea, an abstraction, a human construct. We, humans, Westerners, scientists, philosophers, keep constructing nature collectively out of our intersubjectively communicated interactions with publicly available phenomena as distinct from such other phenomena as our personal dreams or individual visions. At the same time, however, each of us keeps constructing our own individual world out of everything we experience individually, everything, including our personal dreams, and as may happen, our personal intuitions or visions of the unity or duality or divinity of the universe. Nature, the real, may be seen as a collective construct and as such both historically and culturally variable, but also shared by the members of an epistemic community that may be quite extensive. But our personal ontologies, our universe constructs, are highly individuated and as such both unique to each of us and also, as I suggested in the second lecture, more or less scrappy, that is, patchworks or assemblages of logically contradictory ideas and images drawn from many domains and levels of experience. For most of us, I think, including most scientists and endorsers of methodological naturalism, there is, as Hamlet says to Horatio, more in heaven and hell than dreamt of in your or our philosophy or as I would gloss that for our present purposes, more in our individual encounters with the universe than is set forth in current scientific accounts of the shared physical phenomenal world. Some people, however, aspire to be full-time metaphysical naturalists and do not permit anything to enter their individual ontologies or acknowledge that there is anything in them except with that I, what they have put there on good scientific authority. These include what I call the evangelical skeptics. Metaphysical naturalists convinced that the way they conduct their own cognitive lives is the way everyone universally should conduct his or hers. As it happens, a number of such evangelicals, including some well-known evolutionary theorists, have involved themselves in current debates over the nature, value, and future of, respectively and contrastively, science and religion, which brings me to the main topic of today's lecture. As we've seen, what solves the evolutionary riddle of religion in the new naturalist accounts of it that is, what explains the persistence of religious beliefs and practices in spite of their evident costs in biological fitness, 
is that they are the products or byproducts of cognitive mechanisms, impulses, intuitions, systems of responses, and so forth, that conferred fitness benefits on our Stone Age ancestors. Thus, evolutionary psychologist Pascal Boyer, in a passage of particular interest uh, here today, observes that religion is a likely thing because, as he puts it, supernatural concepts are parasitic on mental systems that would be there in any case. Indeed, Boyer adds, invoking a currently circulating conceit, that is kind of artful idea, uh, he adds, religion is a much more likely thing than science because religion is natural while science is unnatural. Boyer cites as supporting this claim a recent essay by Robert Macaulay, whom we encountered in the first lecture as co-author of the self-consciously confrontational new naturalist book, Rethinking Religion. The essay in question is titled The Naturalness of Religion and the Unnaturalness of Science, in which Macaulay echoes the arguments of a book by British biologist Lewis Wolpert, itself titled The Unnatural Nature of Science. These shared claims and duplicated arguments are worth our attention here. Macaulay explains that his essay is provoked by scholars who maintain that because religion is not or not simply a natural phenomenon, its study requires methods other than those of the natural sciences. Seeking to turn the tables on such arguments, Macaulay replies that religion is, on the contrary, something supremely natural, while it is actually science that is unnatural. As is often the case, however, with polemical table turnings, the reversal here does not come off altogether smoothly. The argument, as Macaulay lays it out, consists of a series of strongly contrastive characterizations appealing to apparently straightforward observations supplemented by historical and experimental evidence. Thus he argues that we may conclude from the fact that religion is found in all times and cultures that it requires nothing but the universals of human nature to spring up, while conversely, given the historical and cultural rarity of science, we may conclude that it is essentially contrary to human nature. Or later, that inasmuch as science requires literacy, complex social arrangements, educated elites, and technical means for preserving and transmitting knowledge, it is fundamentally cultural, while conversely, inasmuch as religion requires nothing but basic cognitive abilities, it is non-cultural. Or again, that from the fact that religious concepts are easy to learn and remember and quickly ac acquired even by young children, we may conclude that they conform to innate intuitions, whereas from the fact that scientific concepts are hard to learn and take specialists years of hard study to master, we may conclude that they are counterintuitive and demand exceptional forms of cognitive discipline. These contrasts are in some ways plausible sounding, draw on familiar observations, and are presented by Macaulay with a string of references to the psychological literature. But the distinctions and alignments on which they are based involve considerable conceptual oversimplification and historical obliteration. For one thing, it's not clear in many of these observations that comparable matters are being compared Thus, at the simplest level, we may ask what exactly is it in religion that children acquire so easily and in science that most people never come to master. To be sure, many children who can recite their prayers with ease would have difficulty explaining Einstein's unified field theory. But many children who can recite the multiplication table at the drop of a hat would have difficulty explaining the doctrine of the Trinity. What appears to be the case, but is quite distorted here in the service of a strained contrast, is that certain concepts and verbal routines, whether religious, scientific, 
philosophical or mathematical are acquired readily, while other more complex or sophisticated concepts and formulations, again from various domains, require a highly specialized education and long apprenticeship for their mastery. Second and more fundamentally, in Macaulay's essay, as in Walpert's book and other current invocations of the natural supernatural opposition, the contrast between science and religion requires representing each as a monolith and defining both in tendentious, artificially broad, artificially narrow, or otherwise strained ways. For example, while Macaulay obviously includes in religion everything from Neanderthal burial practices, one of his examples, to Vatican encyclicals, he insists on a quite narrow, historically and culturally specific understanding of science, which of course begs the question of the latter's alleged historical and cultural rarity. The sharp distinction and strong contrast between science and religion here also require our forgetting quite a bit of recorded human history as opposed to tales of prehistoric life. For example, the extensive historical continuities between the two, including for the better part of the past millennium, <clears throat> the close intellectual as well as institutional ties between Western science and Christian theology. Historians of the subject remind us that much of science, originally pursued as natural philosophy, developed in medieval universities that were originally based in monastic orders, and that such pursuits remained theologically oriented long afterward. As late as the 18th century, nature was studied systematically by, among others, Isaac Newton, on the assumption that it embodied divine purpose and with the aim of revealing just how it did so. Indeed, a number of familiar ideals in science, such as the unity, progress, and perfectibility of knowledge, are the fairly direct heritage of Christian doctrine, transmitted through the medieval universities, and extended by enlightenment and evolutionary narratives of human rationality and development. These and other norms and notions shared by Western science and Western religion may also reflect more general human cognitive tendencies. For example, those that incline people everywhere to construct teleological and meliorist narratives, stories of onward and upward, and those that seem to incline men generally to the sense that a strong testosteronic presence is required for important works of the mind or the spirit. Macaulay acknowledges at one point that scientists exhibit the same biases and same cognitive biases and limitations that other human beings do, but he continues, Scientists get around such biases and limitations through tools, quote, tools such as literacy and mathematical description, and through certain norms established and sustained by the institution of science. Norms, he writes, following here traditional sociology of science, which encourage scientists to, quote, seize opportunities to criticize and correct each other's work. The techniques and norms that Macaulay invokes here are certainly significant in sustaining the authority and reliability of scientific knowledge, but their operation is not as simple or their effectiveness as decisive as he implies. Among other more general cognitive tendencies that scientists share with non-scientists, including poets, visionaries, and religious communicants are animism, anthropomorphism, overgeneralization, reification, hypertrophy, binary thinking, hierarchical thinking, linear causal thinking, and teleological thinking. As we've seen, a number of these shared tendencies are illustrated in the conduct of the intellectual projects, both scientific and theological, we've been examining here. That is, the new naturalism as well as the new natural theology. 
Notably here, some of the same psychological mechanisms that operate among theists and theologians to avoid cognitive dissonance, as I described last lecture, and to protect their beliefs from criticism, operate among scientists as well, both individually and as members of epistemic collectives. Indeed, and more generally, precisely in so far as communal norms are established and sustained through what Macaulay calls the institution of science, the basic theoretical assumptions and related habits of perception shared among groups of scientists get established and sustained as well. Accordingly, most contemporary sociologists and philosophers of science reject the old logical empiricist positivist idea always historically dubious that Western science is automatically and dependably self-correcting. I mentioned earlier that Macaulay insists on a quite narrow and arguably tendentious definition of science. To appreciate its rarity, he writes, quoting here Lewis Wolpert, we must not confuse it with technology, Macaulay continues, quote, the crucial point is that the practical orientation of technology and the abstract theoretical interest in understanding nature that characterizes science are not the same. Science is finally concerned with understanding for its own sake and not merely for its effects upon us. But the directive not to confuse science and technology, though familiar, is not so easy to satisfy. On the contrary, distinguishing them at all requires some significant retrospective adjustments. Many of the specialized pursuits we now associate with Western science, for example, physics, chemistry, anatomy, and botany, developed in close conjunction with technical problem solving in such ongoing human activities as navigation, agriculture, medicine, and warfare. A tradition and image of gentlemen investigators interested, as might be said, in understanding the workings of nature only for its own sake, emerged in the 17th century, largely in the science academies of England and Europe. But the conjunction with practical activities continued, and with the dominance since World War II of large-scale scientific ventures funded mainly by government agencies and corporations, any effort to mark off a realm of pure science pursued independent of, quote, a practical orientation toward technology can only be arbitrary and artificial. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm saying the effort to draw a clear line would be very difficult. The depictions of science required to sustain the natural-unnatural contrast with religion are not only historically strained, but pose a conceptual puzzle or new evolutionary riddle for Macaulay and the other new naturalists maintaining it. For given their identification of science with a cognitively unnatural, abstract theoretical interest in understanding nature for its own sake, the question arises as to how, from an evolutionary perspective, it could have come into existence and why it has survived among humans at all. Not surprisingly, Macaulay's arguments lead him to represent science as he defines it as something exceptionally fragile in competition with religion as he defines it. He writes, quote, in the global marketplace of ideas, some views have natural disadvantages. Science, with its esoteric interests, its counterintuitive claims, and its specialized forms of thinking, certainly seems to qualify. Some scholars hold that science was one lo once lost. One consequence of my view, this is Macaulay, is that nothing about human nature would ever prevent its loss again, end quote. Well, this is very ominous sounding. But is the survival of science non-tendentiously non defined really so precarious? 
And given the evolutionary dynamics of human nature as represented by the new naturalists themselves, are the springs of science really all that unnatural or indeed all that remote from those of religion, non-tendentiously defined? The evidence indicates that the array of practices and techniques we now call the natural sciences arose in the course of our ancestors' efforts to solve practical problems of survival and were shaped over time largely to that end. Indeed, rather than technology being, as Macaulay would have it, an incidental byproduct of science, it seems that what he frames as the essence of science, quote, the abstract theoretical interest in understanding nature for its own sake, is an incidental offshoot of technology, that is, a byproduct of cognitive mechanisms naturally selected for the accomplishment of practically oriented activities. Macaulay's essential science is thus what Boyer, in accord with the passage I quoted earlier, would call parasitic, a form of behavior that emerges and persists among humans not because it confers fitness benefits itself, but because it, as he says, recruits or piggybacks on cognitive and other faculties that conferred such benefits in the course of our evolution. Pure science, like other such behaviors, performing or listening to pure music, playing chess, having sex for its own sake, and so forth, exercises cognitive faculties and satisfies bodily drives that evolved in humans for particular fitness-related functions, but the exercise or satisfaction of which is also pleasurable in itself. In the case of science, at least pure science, this would seem to be the pleasure of constructing explanatory models of the world just for the sake of making and contemplating them, quite apart from any practical benefits they might yield or, as Macaulay puts it, not merely for their effects on us. Interestingly, a view of science as parasitic in just this way has been advanced by developmental cognitive psychologist Alison Gopnik. Science is successful, she writes, because it capitalizes on a more basic human capacity what she calls the theory formation system drive. According to Gopnik, citing experimental evidence, the fulfillment of that drive yields the deep satisfaction that humans, including young children, characteristically experience in the production of a good explanation. She remarks, quote, science is thus a kind of epiphenomenon of cognitive development. It is not only that children are little scientists, a view that she advances elsewhere, <coughs> but that scientists are big children, end quote, getting an effect of rush or high from the fulfillment of an elementary drive. She compares it explicitly to sexual pleasure. <coughs> Much in Gopnik's account can be disputed. It's rather heavy for my taste on dubiously postulated drives and systems, and the fulfillment high that she claims is produced specifically by the production of a good proto-scientific explanation is not clearly distinguishable from the kinds of satisfaction elicited by the successful completion of any creative or intellectual venture, or indeed by the successful execution of difficult physical, for example, athletic feats. But her observations are suggestive and make clear that what Macaulay and others allege to be the cognitive unnaturalness of science is by no means self-evident to all cognitive researchers. Moreover, and significantly for another point I've been making here and will continue to make, Gopnik's observations illustrate the possibility of a thoroughly naturalistic psychobiological account of science itself and gives some idea of how disconcerting such an account, not debunking but still rather anti-heroic, might be. 
The differences between science and religion, both duly historically defined, are profound and important. And the stakes, both political and intellectual, in distinguishing them are high. But here as elsewhere, I think the better way to go, both in the political short run and the intellectual long run, is careful delineation and discrimination rather than tendentious characterization or exaggerated contrast. These are worrisome times. Political manipulation of public ignorance threatens due communal regard for scientific knowledge and indeed for the pursuit of disciplined knowledge of any kind. Free inquiry, however, and public respect for intellectual ideals and achievements are not served by sheer scientific self-celebration or by strained efforts to demonstrate the difference between science and everything else. Which brings me to my next topic here. Aside from the political anxieties just mentioned, one reason for the polemical temper of many new naturalists, that is those practicing or promoting evolutionary cognitive approaches to religion, is the common cognitive tendency, no doubt a survival of our tribal past, to identify strongly with one or another community, ethnic, professional, uh, religious, and to experience other communities, especially those most immediately adjacent or currently visible, contradistinctively. In other words, to see the world in terms of us versus them. In the academic world, the tendency is reflected in various disciplinary antagonisms, uh, for example, between clinical and experimental psychologists or between cultural and physical anthropologists, and in the broader two-culture ideology that continues to dominate the contemporary academy. That is the conviction among many scientists and humanists, not merely of important and arguably valuable differences between their respective pursuits, but of their fundamental antagonism. As I've detailed elsewhere, that ideology, with its intellectual provincialisms and self-promoting, other demoting stereotypes, is especially egregious these days in the field of evolutionary psychology and among its promoters and practitioners, including a number of new naturalists, people I've discussed. The stereotypes here include a constellation of routinely disparaged and commonly conflated others. Theologians, scholars of religious studies, cultural anthropologists, and most other social scientists, academics working in the humanities, and to be sure, postmodernists. The sorts of intellectual mischief involved are illustrated in Daniel Dennett's new book, Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon. Dennett celebrates the evolutionary psych cognitive accounts of religion that we've been reviewing here. He cites Boyer, Atron, and Macaulay, and Burkett, the last rather patronizingly, the humanist in the bunch. He um, celebrates them against what he represents as a history of academic resistance and indeed prohibition. Dennett writes, quote, this is a long quote and I'm going to be going over various of its uh, turns of phrase. Dennett writes, the ardent anti-Darwinians in the humanities and social sciences have traditionally feared that an evolutionary approach would drown their cherished ways of thinking with its heroic authors and arts and inventors and other defenders and lovers of ideas. And so they have tended to declare with desperate conviction but no evidence or argument that human culture and human society can only be interpreted and never causally explained using methods and presuppositions that are completely incommensurable with or untranslatable into the methods and presuppositions of the natural sciences." End quote. The mischief here is substantial. 
Dennett supplies no names, citations, or direct quotations. But what he represents as the desperate convictions and traditional fears of ardent anti-Darwinians in the humanities and social sciences are certainly not characteristic of either the views or the motives of those who maintain the value of interpretive approaches as distinct from the search for explanatory theories in their particular fields. There are significant issues of method in regard to the study of human, social, and cultural phenomena. And as I've indicated at various points in these lectures, the array of positions on those issues is complex. Not a matter, as Dennett suggests here, of enlightened evolutionary theorists on the one side and hysterical boobies on the other. Something like the exclusivist position Dennett portrays here, only interpretation, never explanation, has been maintained in religious studies by scholars like Mircea Eliada, who, as I noted in the first lecture, invoke what they see as the unique and, in effect, hallowed character of religion to argue against the very possibility of a naturalistic approach to the subject. Insofar as this position has dominated the field of religious studies, it has certainly confined its disciplinary horizons. But these limiting positions in religious studies and related self-stultifying attitudes among humanities teachers and te uh, students and teachers are very different from the views and motives with which Dennett conflates them here. The latter include first the reasonable observation among scholars in the field of religious studies, quite independent and often in defiance of theological apologetics, that an adequate understanding of the religions of the world, individually and generally, requires, among other things, the sorts of historical, comparative, and interpretive approaches associated with the humanities as distinct from the experimental explanatory approaches associated with the natural sciences. Comparable positions, that is views to the effect that interpretive and other non-natural science, non-explanatory approaches are crucial to the intellectual aims of a particular field of study, can be found among art historians, literary scholars, musicologists, philosophers, and various social scientists as well. Many anthropologists, for example, maintain the value of emic approaches, that is, insider participant viewpoint, to the study, uh, uh, such approaches to the study of other cultures as distinct from etic, outsider observer viewpoint approaches, though, again, not characteristically to the exclusion of the latter. More generally, scholars in most humanities fields are persuaded that there's a distinctive intellectual value to historical, critical, and interpretive approaches to such specifically human activities and productions as art, music, literature, and philosophy. The view Dennett evidently derides here as, quote, their cherished way of thinking with its heroic authors and arts and inventors and other defenders and lovers of ideas, end quote. For scholars maintaining such a view that is of the distinctive value of uh, interpretive and historical approaches, and I count myself among them, the value of such approaches is indeed incommensurable with natural science explanations, not in the sense that they are immeasurably superior to explanatory approaches, which I think is what Dennett is implying, but in the sense that their intellectual products descriptions, exegeses, historical placements, comparisons, and so forth, cannot be assessed by the same measures used to assess scientific explanations, incommensurable. Finally, in this connection, many academics, including, I believe, many scientists, would agree that the characteristic methods and products of the humanities disciplines, interpretations, historical placements and so forth are, as Dennett puts it in tones of, I think, amazement, quote, 
untranslatable into the methods and presuppositions of the natural sciences, end quote. But they would find it hard to see why he finds the idea so stupefying. All the positions I just described argue for the distinctive, irreplaceable value of descriptive, interpretive, historical, or critical approaches in fields that have as their aim forms of understanding, insight, connection making, and reflection that are not characteristically sought in the natural sciences and not characteristically produced by causal explanations derived from natural science models. None of these positions that I've described, however, issues from, quote, a traditional fear of evolutionary approaches. And the totality of those positions does not amount to what Dennett refers to as a taboo on the pursuit of naturalistic explanations of human and cultural phenomena. Musicology maintains no taboo uh, against psychoacoustic explanations of musical sound. Literary studies maintains no taboo against empirical studies of book production or psychological explanations of literary and aesthetic reception. These and comparable naturalistic approaches in art history, classical studies, and other humanistic disciplines have long been staple methods in the fields in question. And with regard to religious phenomena in particular, the dominance of interpretive and so-called phenomenological approaches in the field of religious studies as such has not presented two centuries worth of empirical study and naturalistic explanation of religious beliefs, behaviors, and institutions by anthropologists, archeologists, historians, psychologists, and sociologists, this amounts to thousands and thousands of titles, most of them informed by evolutionary perspectives from the beginning, and none of them involved in the rejection of Darwinian or evolutionary theory as such. So what taboo exactly is Dennett talking about? And who exactly are the ardent anti-Darwinians whose views so exercise him here? The answer, I think, is that there is no effective taboo at all. There are certain people who would like to see naturalistic explanations go away and who keep them to a minimum in their field. But there's no effective taboo at all. And I also think that the people at issue whose views exercise Dennett and whom he calls ardent anti-Darwinians, a phrase that evokes creationists or religious fundamentalists uh, holding forth in university classrooms, uh, not so much these as academics largely in the humanities and social sciences who have challenged the intellectual aims and claims of certain evolutionary approaches in particular and who have noted the intellectual limits and methodological problems of the particular explanations of human or cultural phenomena offered in the name of such approaches in their own fields and elsewhere. These suspicions are deepened by the close resemblance of Dennett's distorted representation here of humanities scholars to their equally distorted representation in recent works by E.O. Wilson and Steven Pinker and by their followers in various fields, including the humanities. To be sure, there are ideologues on both sides of the two culture divide an indiscriminate hostility to science and ignorant rejection of biology by some uh, students and teachers in the humanities exists for institutional reasons I would be glad to discuss later. Um, but these are very different from scholars in the humanities, literary studies, history, classics, philosophy, who resist the uncritical and barely digested importation of terms and methods from one or another currently highly visible scientific field, such as currently evolutionary psychology. What is characteristically resisted in these latter instances, however, is not empirical study as such, or the possibility of naturalistic or biological or indeed evolutionary explanations as such, 
but the claim of scientific authority for crude, glib, pedestrian, and otherwise dubious intellectual wear. Dennett represents the promotion of interpretive methods in the study of religion as a self-deluding spell designed by religious believers in the academy to protect their personal beliefs from demystification. Accordingly, he represents the emergence of the new naturalism, that is naturalistic explanations of religion by way of evolutionary theory and cognitive science, as the breaking of a spell by a few brave iconoclasts, or I suppose Prince Charmings, and the triumph through their efforts of reason and science over fear and superstition. At the same time, like Lewis Walpert, E.O. Wilson, and Steven Pinker, Dennett brushes aside as an aberration of postmodernism the project of contemporary science studies, which is to say, the breaking of a quite explicit and effective taboo in fields such as sociology and philosophy against the naturalistic study of science. I noted the irony of this conjunction at the end of the last lecture. In institutional intellectual terms, it amounts to a science exceptionalism that makes everything subject to naturalistic explanation except science itself. In personal intellectual terms, among the scientists involved, it amounts to a seriously debilitating myopia and self-ignorance. Nietzsche wrote in 1887 that natural science, in its ascetic self-discipline and steadfast faith in truth, was the latest and perhaps the last expression of priestly religious ideals. He also wrote in a comment especially apt here, quote, unnatural science is the self-critique of knowledge, end quote. Self-critique, self-questioning, has long been seen as crucial, crucial to the practices of science, and indeed, as in Dennett's book, as distinguishing scientific knowledge from the dogmatism uh, associated with religious doctrine. But what Nietzsche is suggesting here is that the science that would be truly unnatural in the sense of extraordinary would be that which questioned not merely individual hypotheses, but its own most fundamental assumptions about the very nature of scientific knowledge. It was, of course, just such a self-critique as pursued throughout the 20th century by various historians, philosophers, and sociologists of science that issued in the project we now call Science Studies. Not irrelevantly, it also issued in a widespread rejection of the rationalist epistemology and derived scientistic views of science that sustain dubious understandings, such as Dennett's and Macaulay's, of the relation between science and religion. Which brings me to my final comments here. I've observed throughout these lectures that scientists studying religion are subject to the same general cognitive dispositions that they identify as natural to the human species and that they see as responsible for some of the central features of religion. Of course, that doesn't make science just another belief, like shamanism or Presbyterianism, though I would have to add that none of these, in my view, is just a belief either. The systems of norms and practices that define Western science, notably naturalism, empiricism, and experimentalism, constitute an extremely efficient apparatus for generating models of the operations of the phenomenal physical universe that permit us to predict, control, and intervene in those operations with maximum reliability. To the extent that shamanism or Presbyterianism seek such ends, that is, reliable prediction, control, and intervention, Western science is better at achieving them. Also, many definitive norms and characteristic practices of science, 
such as the exclusion of religious ideas, the open publication of procedures, and the honoring of theoretical innovation are especially effective ways to limit the liabilities of our humanly shared cognitive dispositions. But the effectiveness of scientific norms and practices in both these respects, that is, practical reliability and cognitive discipline, does not make science the only kind of human knowledge there is or the only kind worth seeking. In noting the naturalness and all too humanness of science, my aim here, as I think is clear, has not been to secure a place in the academy for religious profession. If there's a place I'm especially concerned to see secured, it's for the sort of cognitive activities, exploratory, interpretive, critical, and reflective, commonly seen as central to the humanities, though they have often been pursued as part of the natural and social sciences as well. While the general pursuit of such activities is probably irrepressible among humans, their disciplined pursuit seems to be at risk in an increasingly productivist and sometimes unabashedly bottom line academy. Most scientists, along with most other academics, recognize the existence of more subtle goods for themselves individually and more long range goods for the community at large. I speak of such things as open-ended intellectual exploration, civilized reflection, the enjoyment of art, and the mastery of fields of not especially marketable knowledge. But concern for such goods is generally left to the humanities, as is also responsibility for the transmission of the skills, archival, textual, aesthetic, and so forth, that enable participation in them. Since the continued display of that concern and performance of those tasks benefit the entire academic and intellectual community and beyond, it would make sense, I think, for scientists and their spokesmen to join with others who seek to preserve a place for them in the contemporary university. This would mean, at the least, rejecting natural science imperialism and two-culture caricatures of the humanities wherever they occur. It would also mean acknowledging the academic and broader intellectual value of not immediately applicable or marketable cognitive activities, exploration, interpretation, criticism, and reflection wherever they occur. This brings us close to full circle today. Scientists share cognitive tendencies and limits with non-scientists. Non-religionists share them with religionists. Although each may put the world together and conduct his or her life in ways that are at odds with or opaque to the other. The ontology and way of life of each deserves minimally respectful acknowledgement from the other. Such acknowledgement would not mean accepting ideas one finds fantastic or claims one knows are false. And of course, it would not mean approving practices one knows are confining, maiming, or murderous to oneself or others. What it would mean is recognizing as parallel to one's own the all too human processes by which they came to be formed. Not me says the self-vaunting evangelical skeptic. Tu quoque, you too, says the defensive, resentful theist. Et ego, I too, says the reflexive, reflective naturalist. Thank you for uh, going through all that and making it accessible. But um, th I, I wouldn't, uh, as a scientist, uh, uh, put my champions forward uh, uh, 
as evolutionary psychologists or as cognitive psychologists, but unfortunately, they're the ones who, have, who would enter into this debate that you are facing. Uh, and I think that science, uh, although you've treated it carefully and, uh, and treated it in exactly the way I would uh, endorse and be enthusiastic if more people did, uh, but science itself has uh, uh, more heft and more uh, reliability uh, than uh, the likes of those who are uh, formulating uh, criticisms of uh, everything uh, when, from the viewpoint of evolutionary psychology which is built upon uh, very uh, shaky legs. So I just wanted to say that uh, you, you, you forced into that position and you've explored it brilliantly and I've enjoyed it every minute of it, but uh, these are not my champions. Well, I, I, I know that and believe it. I sometimes refer to the scientific and what I call scientoid projects. Uh, yeah. So, but uh, I don't want to uh, overload uh, my descriptions with, um, let's say, uh, uh, the suggestion uh, of un undercut them even as I'm doing them. So uh, yes, certainly they claim science and much that is done in the name of evolutionary psychology is science and much that is done in the name of evolutionary psychology, as I said in the first lecture, is at some distance from science. Uh, well, the question would be whether the terms of this debate don't bring out, uh, a, don't select a particular section of science, which, uh, you know, it, it may not reflect the... Uh, you mean the debate between religion yes, and science? Yes, yes. Ah, mm -hmm. that, that may, that's, that's a good point, thanks. Barbara, I know we've talked about this before, uh, you and I, and uh, it was raised in one of the discussions by one of our graduate students earlier this week, but I, I, I want to hear you say a bit more, um, whenever I get in these kind of conversations, as a person in religious studies, I tend to spend a lot of time trying to educate people who aren't so familiar with what's going on in religious studies now, that one of the things that we are doing, and have been doing, as you know, the last several years, is saying, you know, this whole thing that there is something called religion that is that everybody knows when they see it uh, is very problematic. And usually what that gets boiled down to is something that could be no more uh, substantial than human beings making meaning out of the world, their experience, or, or coming, trying to come up with some ultimate meaning. And if that's all we mean by religion, uh, which is not what most people out in the street mean by religion, then it's a problematic category for comparison purposes because you might find that everywhere, but so what have you found? The other thing is that we keep reminding people that when we in the academy have done, have studied things that we are willing to designate as religious phenomena or religions, we actually have started off with a modern, indeed Protestant notion of what Christianity is, uh, the combination of doctrine, ethics, and ritual, for example that any religion will have those three things. And of course, we, brought, we realized, well, that's very problematic. And we, so we've cr criticized these things all along. And it gets to the point where you kind of think, well, when, these, when other people are talking about religion as this universal human phenomenon, what exactly are they talking about? Um, I have to admit that as a non-scientist, when they talk about the scientific method, I don't, from the outside, I can't see that there is one. Uh, it looks like to me of lots of different methods. So I'm kind of having a problem with just these two terms as so universalizing. And I know you've thought about this. You've talked about it more though from the point of view of looking at science than looking at religion so far in the lectures. Well, thanks very much, Dale. Uh, I, all of those observations are well taken. I do touch on a number of them at various points uh, in, in the lectures. Um, specifically with regard to religion. Of course, in today's lecture, I objected to treating both of them as monolithic and uh, unhistorically. Uh, in the first lecture, I did point out that the, the sort of uh, crisis for religious studies comparable with the term, the heterogeneity and the historical limitations. 
and the notions of ethnocentrism. I didn't know about Protestant centrism, but I take your word for it, uh, of the very uh, category uh, of religion uh, as uh, being a problem for religious studies comparable to the problem very, very similar of what we mean by culture in anthropology and what we mean by literature in literary studies and what we mean by art in art history. All of these terms, once one starts being reflexive and reflective about them, are open to very similar forms of um, commentary. That is, that they are reifications, that they are terms that have their limits defined very often by the very disciplines that take them as objects of study and that their definition as domains of phenomena become very, very difficult to establish otherwise. I also did say um, at, the, uh, at a certain point in the second lecture, uh, and you might have been referring to this, that when you begin to follow the new naturalist um, definitions of religion, indeed it does seem to be something that is everywhere. Uh, your own comment was that that made it um, nothing. I'm not sure that that makes it nothing. That is, it may be interesting then to pursue uh, what it is that is characterized as religion by noticing the ways in which those features are uh, exhibited in that which we don't otherwise uh, um, name religious. Um, so the, those are the, the, uh, the ways in which I would comment, uh, respond to that. Yes, hello. I want to comment about science mm -hmm. and uh, the tendency to think that science consists of the theoreticians and then there's technology, which is not science. But there is also experimental science. These people have the job of falsification. That's unique. In physics, there's probably much more money goes into that than into theoretical work. And it's a, it's a very important distinction. Technology comes out mostly out of their work, but their science, and that's a unique and important thing. I was once taught the scientific method and learned that it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I, I quite agree with that. I, I think I would add, and you probably won't disagree, that the distinction between the theoretical, the experimental, and the applied, okay, is itself difficult to maintain even not only within a discipline, but even within a, a particular scientist's work. In other words, these, these are in continuous. Uh, one is part, what one is doing as a scientist is theorizing, experimenting, conceiving of how um, things, when one says application, how they might turn out, and what might be made of them. Well, this, the, the distinction has a great deal, well, I, not to load the word too much, but these are also ideological distinctions, and they also come attached with their own stereotypes of the theoretical, as opposed to the applied scientist, of the experimentalist, the bench scientist, as opposed to someone who does innovative theorizing. You know that these uh, distinctions are also made by scientists. Yes, uh, Bill. Um, you, you talked about new naturalism and uh, not told us so much about whether there was an old naturalism, mm -hmm. but it would seem to me that this is really not a new subject. That this, this goes back to the Hippocratic's writing about the sacred disease and Hildegard of Bingen's uh, visions explained by her migraine headaches and so on. And, and, the, and uh, to satisfy Professor Schulman, uh, using the, 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 uh, the gold standard of science, that is uh, MRI imaging, uh, the studies of monks meditating in the MRI machine and so on. I mean, neurotheology, which yeah, is a new hot yeah. subject. Yeah. So uh, do well, you see this as just the Darwinian context of, of this long tradition? Well, I have given the name the new naturalism as literally just a shorthand. Otherwise, I could say, <clears throat> 
those approaches that call themselves cognitive evolutionary, particularly as published within the past 15 years and, and with the following people as the major figures. So the new naturalism has been, for purposes here, uh, a shorthand reference. Uh, but I did say at the very beginning that naturalism, indeed I opposed Pascal Boyer's claim, here we are for the first time giving naturalistic explanations of religion. And I did uh, uh, raise a considerable objection to that and rolled out a, a list of names beginning with Lucretius and uh, quotations from Hume and so forth. Hi, I, um, this is sort of based on the questions that, I've been, that, that came up afterwards. I'm just sort of curious whether it makes a difference if we talk about scientific knowledge versus faith rather than science versus religion and whether that affects how we talk about these entities? Some, I think for many um, kinds of contrasts, uh, it, it does make a difference when, whether one is opposing, let's say, scientific doctrine or to religious doctrine, or if one thinks about science as a body of knowledge and religion as a body of doctrine, as opposed to thinking of them as institutions, sets of practices, sets of norms, uh, or whatever, uh, because uh, it's so variable. Yes, certainly. Yeah, okay. Yes. But once you say that, it's a question of faith or scientific knowledge, you can't resist the discussion. Yeah. No, okay, look, I, if I understood the observation correctly, it's just that different kinds of um, comparisons, contrasts, and connections are made if you are thinking of science primarily as a set of ongoing practices and institutions and opposing it to religion as a set of ongoing practices and institutions, or if you are opposing religious doctrine and dogma to scientific knowledge. I'm just saying that you would have different ways of drawing the distinction. That's all. I think that was the point. Yes? Science and religion have, both have those cultural features as, as institutions. But I think it's different as, a, as, a, as an essential way of knowing. And I'm not even talking about science. But, I, but I, said, I said that at great length. I said that the scientific um, norms, practices that we identify with Western science are, is an apparatus that is especially effective, maybe maximally effective, in developing, if I'm I'm quoting myself, but models of the operations of the physical phenomenal world that enable um, their um, prediction, control, and intervention. So that, I think, distinguishes uh, what it is that science achieves and what it is that science aims at from, I said, shamanism or Presbyterianism. If that's what they're aiming for, certainly science does that better. That's, I, I said that. I'm uh, struck by a concluding statement um, about um, the common ground between <clears throat> um, scientists and non-scientists as the cognitive limits. Um, and once again, the cognitive limits. Sorry, say it again. I, oh, I, the common ground between scientists and non-scientists as the cognitive limits shared by both, and cognitive limits likewise as the common ground between people who are religious uh, and people who are not. So it seems to me a very interesting way to think about um, where people can come together. And actually, it's not in what they believe in or what they profess, but in a certain kind of limitation. What they can't. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes, certainly. Yes. Still stand for Would you, do you want to give your, uh, I, I'm very happy to see you again, but you should give your name and your, uh, uh, where you're coming from. For, yes, for my name is Louis Dupre. And uh, my profession is philosophy, or at least teaching it. Um, <clears throat> I would like to ask two more questions. To, the first one is this. What do you think of the following proposition? Given and granted that the evolutionary science, to, limited to that particular science, has nothing to say about theology about metaphysics and so on, which we will take for granted now. <clears throat> as long as they do not exclude 
any kind of metaphysical or philosophical or anthropological speech that deals with, but no, I should exclude that word anthropological, that's wrong, but uh, any kind of approach that deals with definite transcendence. With definite so, what, say it again? Transcendence, yes. I, I, I am trying to avoid the word God here for, for a moment. Given that, could we not say the following, that intelligent design must be out of biology, yes, because at that point, we, the person who advocates that interferes with one of the most critical points in the evolutionary science, at least in the mutation theory, namely the fortuitous character of the mutations, the contingent character of the mutations. On the other hand, the biologist must be left with that question which you formulated in the beginning. Uh, why is the nature of this kind? I never asked that question. I never asked the why question. As I, I, I did not myself pose that question. The question was posed, and I quoted it last time from Hort, namely, yes. science doesn't ask the why question. But I think no, science, I, I agree. science uh, asks lots of why no, questions. No, but I mean, as a, as a human being, the scientist will, will wonder why is there why is it that we can work this way why but there are people who don't for whom that question does not arise as a question it doesn't in other words Fine. the naturally occurring world is simply taken as naturally occurring the question of why suggests a certain way of interpreting of being obliged to or of, uh, interpreting namely that there is going to be an answer to a why namely no. Whatever. I don't, uh, there I, uh, I, I don't think that the why question is built into anything. I think that it the, occurs uh, over and over again, but I think that it comes from a way that is already in place of thinking. In other words, it comes from the existence of purposive scripts that one says, but why? If one doesn't have teleological scenarios that one is operating okay. with, one let need me, not ask the why question. Let me rephrase it then. If you, if you don't want to accept that, let's rephrase it this way, that it is not excluded as a human being. That That's what I have said. Scientist. I have said it's not excluded. No, 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 no. What can prevent a human being from asking a why right question? The question is by no means a critique of your thought. No, 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 I understand. It's trying to confirm it. But uh, then you still have the following question that uh, if, if, that can, if that issue can be raised, then it seems to me that we come in religion with a very difficult problem here. How can we raise in religion the question of God or the question of transcendence after we have somehow in evolution, and in particularly in the interventory, yeah, in, in the whole question of creation, after we have more or less eliminated that from that field and have particularly excluded the notion of intelligent design. So I, I exclude it, but I do have a problem. I mean, I, I can believe in God, I can accept transcendence, but when it comes to saying, what is creation then? What is it if we eliminate that from there? Then we would have to come in religion, not in biology, but in religion with some kind of, uh, how shall I put it, formulation where we would have to say, yes, there is a question here for us religious people. That's the first thing. The second question is the following. I think if the people in religion are getting a lot of flack from characters like Dawkins and Dennett, it's a little bit also their own fault, if I may say so. Fanatical as the talk is, <laughs> there is not only a biological naturalism, but there is also a theological naturalism. For example, this thing started, I think, really becoming a problem in the 16th century. <coughs> and early 17, because at that point, we started raising 
questions in terms of physics. For example, the whole, the whole Cartesian and Spinozistic questions are form about God are formulated entirely in terms derived from, from mechanistic physics. Uh, yes. What is the mechanistic cause of the world? The cause of mm -hmm. motion. Mm -hmm. And I also think that this has not improved. Quite the opposite. I, in other words, it's the naturalistic pretensions of religion that yes. you find yes. exposes it yes. to the kind of reaction that you get in Dawkins and Dennett. I think. If, you, if yeah. you listen today in, in, let us say, in religious studies to someone, you hear nothing but words like models and paradigms <laughs> and all that stuff that is straight <laughs> taken out of the book of, uh, yeah. of uh, a text, uh, a mandatory textbook of so on these two questions, I, have, I would like to have an answer. <laughs> well, I think I actually have, have answered. In, in other words, I think that the notion of what comes out, what inevitably comes out of religion and out of a religious sensibility, you have described well. And I don't think we disagree, I hope not, that it's possible not to have a religious sensibility and it's possible not to be in religion, but to be someplace else. Um, the second point, I, just, I simply think it's a very nice point. I, I don't myself uh, know that much contemporary theological writing, but I take your word for it. It sounds very, very plausible that it has its own forms of scientism uh, that expose it to claims that it wants to frame, uh, claims that theologians want to frame in scientific terms and therefore exposes them to the kind of response that one gets from Dawkins and Dennett. That, that seems fine to me, uh, a, a proper observation. Yes. Hello, uh, my, na my name is uh, Willard Maranker from the Computer Science Department. I think I heard you say at the beginning of your talk that science itself was, was filled or replete with metaphysics. I No, I didn't. I, what I said is that there are places in at the limits of scientific knowledge where the assumptions can only be called metaphysical because at those limits, the empirical uh, appeal is faltering simply because it is. Well, I, w I want to applaud you for saying that. I see. Okay. And, uh, and I want to say that you probably should have run more with that idea and including the criticism that scientists take themselves far too seriously. <laughs> Thanks to Professor Smith for a brilliant set of lectures.